on the verge of collapse. I'm your host, Steve Van Beter, and thanks for joining me today. Our lead story today, a major country edges closer to economic ruin. And I want to understand why this is going to spark an all out panic, because it's not just the fact that this country is going down, it's what's causing them to actually experience an economic recession that's going to spread across the entire world in every major industrialized economy. Plus, did the Fed finally engineer the impossible? Or did they just engineer the next financial crisis? And small businesses are facing a worst case scenario. We're gonna show you why many of them won't survive. And if you're wondering why everyone at the IMF meeting is staring at me, well, I just happened to tell them all that they have no idea how monetary policy works. And we have a sponsor for today's show, Ellis Game Technology. They're enhancing your betting business in sportsbook solutions and casino software. You can find them on the NASDAQ under the symbol E-L-Y-S. As with all of our sponsors, we love to show you how to trade their stock. And we think they're going to be enhancing your trading account as their stock is about to break out of a trading zone, which we think could generate a 37% return. Stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now let's head over to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up with a headline, Treasuries have best day since March on signs the Fed may be done. And this is really what everyone's hopeful for, that the Fed has finally reached terminal rates. As we've been talking about, their biggest issue, they haven't even said this up until now, is that they didn't like the fact that the long end of the Treasury curve wasn't reacting because the Fed does not understand. Now, if you go back, to the early 1980s and before, they, when the Fed moved, the short end of the curve and the long end of the curve moved, and then it stopped, that relationship broke. And what they don't understand is that long-term treasury yields are a function of growth and inflation expectations, and the market is saying, Fed, you've got this completely wrong. The U.S. 10-year yield slid as much as 18 basis points to 4.62% on Tuesday, a day after two Fed officials expressed the idea that the recent surge in U.S. yields may have done some of the job of tightening financial conditions for them. The move to ease as traders in the U.S. got underway. So notably, it's worth understanding that the Fed thinks that higher interest rates tighten financial conditions. And this should just be an illustration because many of you say, Steve, does the Fed really believe this stuff? Well, if they don't, they're really good at making sure we do believe it because higher interest rates don't cause financial conditions to tighten. What causes them to tighten is when the yield curve inverts and short-term yields are higher than long-term yields. And yet, despite the fact that the Fed is getting their way, here we can see the yield curve. This is a 10-year minus two-year, and what's under the black line, that tells us two-year yields are higher than 10-year, and what we are still seeing after this recent move is the yield curve is inverted. That means banks still are in a position to keep financial conditions tight, has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with higher interest rates, but only the difference between the 10 and the two-year and other parts of the yield curve. We know those inverted inversions and the inverted money curves are all that actually matters here because as we know, when banks originate fewer loans, less money is created and eventually that causes the wheels of the economy to grind to a halt. The Fed speakers, quote, seem very much on the same page in noting higher bond yields and tighter financial conditions will impact their thinking on the federal funds rate, which is really all anyone cares about is the fact that the Fed may actually be done here. Market pricing suggests the Fed likely won't hike this year and may still be at risk. A final insurance increase suggesting that while the market isn't sure how the Fed is going to respond, we're hearing from speakers saying more and more that they now perhaps need to wait and see if these higher interest interest rates do indeed bring inflation down to the suggestion that the market is starting to believe that perhaps sometime early next year, there may be, we'll call it a safety hike. Of course, we know by then the economy in the U.S. and the rest of the world is not going to be spiraling up, but down. As Fed Vice Chair Philip Jefferson said, he's watching the increase in Treasury yields. Well, good. Somebody needs to watch them as a potential further restraint on the economy, even though the rate of inflation remains too high. Fellow policymaker Lori Logan said the recent increase in long-term yields may indicate the need for the central bank 
the less need for the central bank to raise rates again. All this to suggest is now they're acting like, hey, we've been raising rates to get the short term rates to get long term rates higher. Perhaps they should have said that from the beginning. But of course, again, they think it's all about interest rates. And I want to take you back now to the 1980s and show you why it was about interest rates and why now it has nothing to do with them, even though the Fed believes that's the only way inflation comes down. But of course they do, because it's the only policy tool they have. Here you can see the consumer price index in blue. That shown on a year-over-year -year rate change against the 30-year. This is what they're focused on, the long end of the curve. And you can look and see back here in the 80s what happened. It straight had to go up to break inflation. And you see it happened twice. But then after that, what started to happen in the early 1990s, and I suggested this a little bit ago when I said things change. And it's right. Everything did change in the system. And now you can actually see interest rates were falling ahead of the peak of inflation. You see that again in the dot-com bubble, global financial crisis, even, of course, the little bit of inflation we saw into 2015, 2016, yields were falling and it broke. We see that going into the pandemic when inflation was headed down, yields were already falling, and now just the opposite. It's like we're going back to this 1980s playbook and the global economy, the global financial system is completely different but not to the policymakers. Now, the challenge they're gonna face here is in addition to having financial conditions tight due to the inverted yield curve, higher rates are going to keep people from spending money and instead go lock that money up into the banking system. When all of these things get together and start to hit the economy at once, you're gonna watch the data do something we haven't seen in a long time, and let's go straight down as consumers stop spending. And one place that knows of that, well, small businesses. And we got the small business optimism. It dips in September, this report today, as inflation remains top problem. Now, we've made the case of why inflation is a problem for small businesses, but not for the reason that people think. It's because it squeezes their margin. They're under pressure to give raises. They're under pressure because their costs have gone up, but prices aren't rising enough for them to keep their margin. And sure enough, that's a huge problem as small businesses are going to face annihilation. Here we can see the optimism index decreased half a point in September to 90.8. The September's reading marks the 21st consecutive month below the 49-year average. And that's a lot of data of 98. So you can see optimism well below trend. 23% of owners reported inflation was their single most important problem in operating their business as owners remain pessimistic about future business conditions and rightfully low show so because consumers are changing their spending habits because they don't have as as much money. Sales growth among small businesses have slowed and the bottom line being squeezed, leaving owners few options beyond raising selling prices for financial relief. Of course, one of those options, we're not there yet, but we're going to be there in a matter of months, is them starting to get rid of employees. But notably, they don't want to do that, at least not yet. According to the jobs report built into this one, 43% of all small business owners reported job openings they could not fill in the current period up three points from August. So they're still looking. In fact, owners plan to fill open positions remains elevated with seasonally adjusted net 18% planning to create new jobs in the next three months. Of course, we're going to make we're making the case the economy is going to slow down a whole bunch. When we look at this country later in the show that's collapsing, they are going to happen in the matter of a few months. Months, and that's going to spread to the rest of the world. Small businesses aren't going to be hiring. They're going to be laying off and trying to unload their bloated inventories. Because the net negative, like this, 8%, net negative 8% of all owners reported higher nominal sales in the past three months, up six points from August lowest readings since August 2020. That percentage of owners expecting higher real, real sales volumes improved 1% to a net negative 13%. So they're absolutely selling less here. And how about this? A net 36% raised ported raising compensation in September, a seasonally adjusted net 23% plan to raise compensation in the next three months. That is key. So we're seeing, and we said this would happen, that they would stop, that pay raises were coming to end. Fewer and fewer companies gonna offer them, and that number was coming down. At the same time, what are we hearing from policymakers like the Fed and the Ch Fed Chief Powell is they're worried about the wage price spiral. Well, this report's saying, yeah, it's not gonna happen. 9% of owners cited labor costs as their top problem, while 23% that labor quality 
was their top problem, saying they can get people, just can't get them to work. And here we look at total compensation. This is average weekly hours multiplied by average hourly earnings. This is a production in non-supervisory employees. We know this trend lower here, and it's going to continue as fewer businesses give out fewer raises, and that means eventually less hours worked as well, and that means compensation comes down and inflation comes down, and next thing you know, job losses with it. A frequency of reports of positive profit trends was, well, net negative 24%. That's not what you're looking for in terms of a soft landing or a booming economy. Among orders reporting lower profits, 29% blame weaker sales, which is a huge problem. I mean, if that is your problem, that we have weaker sales, that kind of validates everything we've been talking about on the show and how the economy is indeed slowing and we're not seeing the soft landing that everybody including the fed thinks is actually happening it's not and 20 percent blame the rise in the cost of materials 15 sided labor costs eight percent said lower prices seven percent said the usual seasonal change and meanwhile taxes and other problems but the issue here is for owners reporting higher profits 55 percent credited sales volumes and 22 percent cited unusual seasonal changes while what we're going to see in the months to come as we hit the holiday season is there's going to be big problems for small businesses because what do we know the pandemic money is gone the student loan repayments are back and we know those lags from increasing the federal funds rate are going to hit credit cards which means those minimum payments are going up even more but somebody who knows nothing about monetary policy oddly enough has it in their name that's the IMF the International Monetary Fund warns of stubborn inflation and weaker global growth in 2024. Well, we'll say they got one of those two right. How about this? The IMF boosted its projection for the pace of consumer price increases across the world to 5.8% for the next year and its world economic outlook released yesterday up from five point or up today up 5.2 percent seen three months ago the call for vigilance on inflation comes as it also trimmed its forecast for economic growth in 2024 of course if growth goes down inflation goes down i know they don't get it i know they don't understand it but everyone now believes that this inflation problem is sticky because of course rates aren't high enough they haven't done that much damage but when you get really periods of really high inflation you know what's strange about it it takes a while for it to come back down it just does and they don't get it but i'm going to show you why the international monetary fund this is why all eyes were on me because i put this chart on their screen and they just don't understand it here we're looking at the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes now we'll note that banks are tightening standards anytime that the blue line is above that horizontal black line. Meanwhile, we've got that against the consumer price index shown on a year over year rate of change, that one in red. And notably, when banks constrict credit, when less money is created in the economy, which makes absolutely perfect sense, you have less money created, meaning demand has to go down because there isn't enough money to chase all the money and demand people want. And what happens? Inflation comes down every single time. This time it is coming down. We might on Thursday see a bit bump higher due to energy, but the broad trend is consumer spending slows down. We're going to see inflation come crumbling down, not just to 3%, not to the Fed's target of two, but likely to zero and potentially even into deflation because we know the longer the banks curtail credit creation, the worse it's going to get. And this time it's bad. As monetary policy needs to remain tight in most places until inflation is durably coming down, and then we're going to ease like crazy. Well, they didn't say that, but they're going to do it. We're not quite there because, well, we're not, even though we probably have done enough damage at this point. The surge was spurred by factors, including coronavirus pandemic supply chain disruptions. That is a factor. Here's a big one. Fiscal stimulus in response to the global lockdown, which was way too much money all at one time. Subsequent strong demand. Of course, you give people a lot of money, tell them to stay home and spend it. Well, turns out they do. Anti labor market in the U.S. because, well, the market went up and people went off and retired. And food and energy disruptions from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which all had a particular effect in Europe and the U.K., are all mitigating factors here to what we're seeing, and they keep missing the boat. We're seeing a global economy that's limping along. It's not quite sprinting yet. The problem isn't that the global economy is sprinting. It's it's limping it's limping down and falling it's going to fall over they think it's limping to sprinting we're saying limping to complete face plant on the ground and here we are now 
to our lead story. This country is just, again, on the edge of collapse. Here we can see China, major problems as China molds new stimulus, because why do they need stimulus? Because their economy is slowing, they can't turn it around. As higher deficit to meet growth goal, they're finally admitting it, capitulating here, as policymakers are weighing on the issuance of at least one trillion yuan of additional sovereign debt for spending on infrastructure, such as water conservatory projects, and we know that could also raise this year's budget deficit to well above the 3% cap set in March, and that announcement may come as early this month. Although deliberations are ongoing as the government's plans could change, the question here is, will it work? The answer is no, because what is the real problem? Why are we having an issue in China in particular? Because there's a global dollar shortage. Why are we having a global dollar shortage? Because global trade is collapsing. And on top of that, the Fed raised rates. So rather than dollars circulating around the world, what everyone's doing is parking them in the banking system. When you start to understand how this whole system is coming, going to grow, grind to the halt, it will make perfect sense to you. But further evidence that problems in China are worse than we even know? Well, Country Garden signals default as China's property woes deepen. We said this isn't going away, even though everyone said, don't worry, China will run to the rescue. They're one thing they can't rescue. They just don't have the dollars. As China's former top builder warned in the stock exchange filing Tuesday, they will not be able to meet all of its future onshore payment obligations, including, here you go, dollar bonds. Why? Because there's a global dollar shortage. Such non-payment may lead to relevant creditors demanding acceleration of payment or pursuing enforcement action if needed. Of course, Country Guard's latest statement said it may pressure the offshore bondholders to approve any upcoming restructuring proposal. Translated to saying is, if you want to get paid, you'll take our offer. Otherwise, we're probably going to default and you'll get nothing. Of course, we know what they'll do. They'll accept the offer, but not after a bunch of deliberation. The company is clearly in a liquidity crunch, meaning we just don't have dollars, with many unfinished projects to complete and limited access to new financing. Again, we're making the case that China's real estate sector is going to come collapsing down. They have a major dollar shortage, and the issue isn't that their country is, come, is going to see a recession or perhaps a financial crisis or even a depression. That is not the issue. The issue here is there is a global dollar shortage, and once China goes down, that shortage will rapidly spread to every major industrialized country, and the next thing you know, it will come right back home. But one thing we do think is a potential home run for your trading account. That's our sponsor for today's show, LS Game Technology. Again, they're on the NASDAQ. Let's take a look under the symbol ELYS. And we'll show you why, based on their chart setup, we think there's a potential 37% move. Now, we've got all the information on LS in the description and the pinned comment below as they're enhancing your betting business with their sportsbook solution and online casino software. Let's take a look at what they're doing because Ellis delivers a true state-of-the-art betting platform capable of processing any type of digital game content from integrated sports and virtual betting solutions to any third-party content including online casino slot games poker bingo lottery plus all types of interactive games and they've got decades of experience doing it the difference in ellis advanced management technology as their data-driven sportsbook risk management services and adaptive business intelligent dashboards enable their customers to get the absolute best business performance from their betting operations and one thing we think is going to get the best too and that's your trading account let's take a look at their chart setup again under the symbol elys on the nasdaq of course we love talking about supply zones here and i want you to see you know, as we look at this one-year chart, you'll notice above, we've got a sell zone. We know that's a sell zone because when price gets up there, what have we seen? Sellers. Look at the one on the bottom. Where do you think shows up? That's where the buyers are at. We can see it. Now, there's this kind of middle zone here. You'll notice price gets up there and sellers have shown up repeatedly, pushing it back down into that bottom zone. But look what's happening now. It's starting to break out of that middle tier zone. And we see here just over the last day, it's pulling back a little bit, holding, looking to hold support here. If it does, you're talking a 37% move breakout. And you can see how fast it moves between those supply zones. You can look at the MACD. It's got a positive cross moving higher. We've got the RSI bouncing near overbought territory, but we know momentum can stay overbought for long periods of time. Let's take a look at the company profile here for Ellis. The company has two operating segments from which it derives revenue, the operating of its web-based as well as land-based leisure betting establishments situated throughout Italy and the USA. We'll talk more about it both in a moment. As a provider of certified betting platform software services to leisure betting establishments in the US and nine other countries.
And their focal point is on industry tailwinds. They've got end-to-end sportsbook business model and rapidly growing industry. They've got potential synergies with their ability to synchronize with multiple potential industry partners. They've got valuable tech stack, which is high quality cash generating sports betting supplier with in-house technology and trading services. And they've got complimentary offerings as the opportunity to expand into new gaming adjacent products with small scale retail and digital sports betting services all with Elsa's game technology. Let's talk about their stock here as we zoom in to that 90 day chart. Again, you'll notice, look at the volume profile now showing up here right around 50 cents. That's where the buyers are now at. We've noted the sellers have been there too. Buyers here above it, pushing right up into the top of the supply zone. Notice how the volume here tapers off. That's why you see these big moves very quickly through supply zones because there's not a lot of trading volume here. The sellers are above, that's our case. This breaks out above this range of over 50 six cents we're looking to move into the 74 to 80 cent range making that your 23 percent potential move to the upside Let's take a look at some recent developments. They've got an acquisition launch of 100 land-based rights in Italy, development of virtual sports product for Lottomatica in Italy. Their U.S. infrastructure installation is updated, and they're working on that as they launch their U.S. mobile platform and their recent expansion of land-based clients in the U.S. Let's talk about some opportunities. They've got some expansion procurements. A scalable structure allowed Ellis to benefit from growth in the online gaming and sports betting market through both revenue share agreements and bet spreads. They've got their proposed launch of the Ellis 5D B2C channel in Ohio retail markets in Q3 of this year and up to 3,000 potential location distribution points. They've also got their mobile launch, which is capitalized on the destabilization and scarcity of competent competition as customer demand for better product options and investor demand for leaner management. These launches are coming in Colorado, Louisiana, New Jersey, and Ontario, Canada. And one thing we think is going to launch is their stock here we're zooming in now to the 30 day you see on that that nearly the same spot at 48 cents we showed you on the 90 day chart the volume profile is at 50 cents providing some nice support below it now broke up into that sell zone it looks like it's holding there sellers are trying but if this breaks out to the upside there's your case for that 37 percent move of the upside look at the rsi bounced just briefly off oversold but nice pattern of rising momentum macd is moving higher everything you want to properly see to see move for this stock to head higher but as always with any company we feature on our show you're under no obligation to purchase their stock you should do your own research before placing any trades again ellis game technology symbol e l y s on the nasdaq again check them out in the pinned comment description below and with that i'm steve van meter thanks for watching thanks for being fans bye now